Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 453. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Pelegi. And today is October 29th, 2018. I want to welcome you back to the show, David. Um, for our audience, we have David on when we discuss things related to the Middle East, uh, conflict, uh, anything happening uh, that's big news in Israel. Uh, this is the first time I've had David on talking about something that's happened here in America. Um, who is David Poligli? Uh That's going to be the big question because we have a lot of new audience members. Uh, they didn't know who uh, David Old was. And I got these emails. Who's David Old? I don't understand. What, where did this guy come from? So now I introduce our new uh, participants and correspondents. David, uh, you are a rector in a very famous church out in Jerusalem. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm the rector of uh, Christ Church in Jerusalem. It's the oldest Protestant church, the oldest uh, Anglican church uh, uh, in this part of the Middle East. Uh, I come from the United States. I think everyone can uh, hear yeah, that you, by my uh, accent. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have been living... Uh, in Jerusalem with my wife and uh, three children for 38 years. Huh. So, uh, do you have a dual passport? No, actually I don't. Uh, we are American citizens, but uh, we are residents. Uh, okay. We have the Israeli equivalent of a green card. Uh, so. And you helped host uh, GAFCON 3 out there. Have you recovered at all? Well, I, we were actually a little bit more involved in GAFCON 1. Uh, and uh, yes, we've been involved with GAFCON 3, and uh, we're still high a little bit. Uh, it was such a great uh, experience uh, to meet so many uh, new folks and to meet old friends uh, and to participate and, and to help a little bit, uh, as we were privileged to do. Uh, it really was the highlight of our year. Maybe it'll be the highlight of our decade, but uh, we're really grateful. Uh, to all the GAFCON folks who uh, turned to us and asked, you know, for our assistance. I'm having you on today's show because we're going to talk about a hard topic. Um, we had a, a terrorist attack here in America uh, last week where a, uh, an American walked into a synagogue uh, and uh, killed almost a dozen people. Uh, he was an anti-Semite. He hated Jews. He was very vocal about that. And his rage reached to the point where he decided to take lives. And I wanted to kind of talk about anti-Semitism more in general terms, more of a global scale, because it's been here forever. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of the, the longest lasting uh, racism you've ever seen. And I think it will be here until the end of time. That's my opinion. It, we'll have to see right. if that changes. But I, I kind of want to talk to you about this because when you try to pin down anti-Semitism, you can't just point to the right of politics or the left of politics. It, it's kind of, you know, in general, uh, esteemed in both the left and the right. And right. because some of it is very vocal and some of it is very hidden and institutional. And I kind of uh -huh. want to talk to you about that. Um, especially more recently, I've seen the institutional, the BDSs, the, the college campuses and whatnot, try to take on uh, how do we hurt Israel because they're hurting the Palestinians, in their opinion. Right. Um, what does Israel see when they look out, uh, obviously in their borders and globally uh, to the anti-Semitism? Well, uh, it, Israel, like the American Jewish community, uh, has been traumatized uh, by the Holocaust. And, uh, by the way, many of your uh, viewers may not understand it. Israel has been uh, traumatized by years of war uh, and terrorism. And uh, many folks who, who now live in Israel uh, came from other countries uh, or other Middle Eastern countries, Iran, Turkey, uh, Egypt, Iraq, um, uh, Morocco, Algeria, and so on. And uh, they also uh, lived uh, as uh, third-class citizens uh, amongst uh, the Muslims. So Israel is a fairly uh, 
traumatized place. And when Israel, of course, looks out at the world, I think uh, oftentimes like the American uh, Jewish community, uh, they see Holocaust. Now that may not always be objective. Uh, not every uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, act or not uh, every time uh, an anti-Semitic incident happens, you know, that it can be equated uh, with the Holocaust. And in fact, most of the time uh, it can be, uh, it, it can't, but still at the same time because of the experience of the Jewish people and the experiences uh, of uh, most of the population here in Israel, uh, what they tend to see is not good. Okay? Well, Israel, uh, today's Israel is a young country. Uh huh. In, in political terms. And like you said, everybody uh, there is from somewhere else, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, where they were. Uh, uh, subjugated to a difficult life, um, they were moved around, and so you, I, I see uh, when I go to Israel, a people that are tense, and I think it's, a lot, you know, a lot of that is the border issues and stuff. Right. Now, well, there's a tension, and at the same time, there's a uh, th there's a great uh, joyfulness in Israel. It's it's a contradiction and a paradox, and Israel's full of paradoxes and full of contradictions. I don't know if you've noticed, but in recent surveys uh, uh, that take place just about every year, they have these professionals that try to rate the uh, happiest countries in the world. And Norway usually comes in first, but coming in around nine or ten every year is Israel. And you have to ask yourself with all these uh, uh, problems, the problems of Iran and the problems of hundreds of thousands of missiles in the hands of Hezbollah and Gaza and uh, a, you might say, an inability or division in the society that uh, prevents Israel from uh, addressing its issues with the Palestinians, what is there to be happy about? But uh, Israelis find, uh, I think, a great deal of joy uh, in their identity and their Jewish identity and a great deal of joy in their religion, a huge amount of joy in family life. Uh, and so uh, we live with this tension and uh, this very interesting, uh, very interesting paradox. So. One of the things I discovered when I first ran into anti-Semitism after college, um, my wife and I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, kind of benign, anything there was under the surface. We ended up in Huntsville, Alabama. And one of my coworkers from Alabama was anti-Semitic, I discovered. And he had these things he would talk about, how um, all Jews are wealthy. He would say Jews are stingy and greedy. Um, he would say they control the business world. Uh, what uh, I wrote down a couple of things. Uh, the Jewish religion emphasizes profit and materialism. Um, and he would say, at first I would just you know kind of ignore what he said, and, and I finally had to engage him uh, in what he believed, and I just found out it was just kind of the way he was raised. Uh -huh. uh, his parents taught him this. Uh, the uh -huh. people who grew up with in, in his community uh, believe this, and they just came to blame all their ills on one uh, uh, identified people, the Jews. So, you know, this is very deep uh, culturally uh, and spiritually, and uh, it's quite embedded uh, in our society. Unfortunately. We as Christians are partially responsible for this, but uh, actually anti-Semitism was quite prevalent uh, in the ancient world, uh, uh, the ancient uh, uh, Greco-Roman world, even before the arrival of uh, Christianity. And one of the things you can't do with most anti-Semites is uh, you can't confuse them with the facts. Uh, you, because if you will say to them, you know, the most generous ethnic group in the United States, the group that gives the most money, the most often charity, uh, are Jews, well, they're going to somehow deny that it's a reality. Or if you ask them, tell me, uh, what quote-unquote businesses do Jews happen to uh, control? Do they control the steel-making business? Are they uh, in coal? Do they 
make cars? Do they own the electric power plants of the United States? And, and of course, uh, these are industries where you probably won't find uh, very many Jews. So uh, once you present, uh, you know, a certain reality uh, to these folks, uh, sometimes they change, but uh, their worldview uh, oftentimes doesn't change because what we're dealing with is something that is very, very deep. It's estimate, not estimated, but it's uh, it's it's been uh, re researchers conclude that probably one in five of every American uh, has some kind of uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, viewpoints or or uh, points of view, and uh, they might be a mild, moderate, or even a radical, uh, hardcore anti-Semite. And this anti-Semitism, which kind of bubbles underneath the surface of, uh, of many countries or many societies, will oftentimes break out uh, in, uh, in, in some kind of a, a wave or, uh, that uh, is inexplicable. No one quite knows why it happens. So, for example, after the, uh, the Second World War, when anti-Semitism was that a was that its all time high? Forty five, fifty percent uh, of the American public was quite uh, uh, radically uh, anti Semitic. Uh, so today, the fact that it's twenty percent is is an improvement. But the, you have waves of anti Semitism, and sometimes it's like a volcano when you least expect it, and for no reason uh, these waves blow up. So from 58 to 60 was uh, a wave of worldwide anti-Semitism. It wasn't tied to the economy or tied to political, uh, political events around the world. And then 78 to 82 um, was another wave. And then we had the, la the last wave, 87 uh, to 93. And we might be uh, on uh, the cusp, uh, I can mix a metaphor, uh, of another wave that uh, is uh, going to break out in the United States, certainly in Europe. Uh, I don't follow what's going on in Europe. There, there is, of course, uh, a dangerous, uh, a dangerous wave this, uh, of uh, anti-Semitism, which is in large part fueled by the right, uh, the alternative, the alt-right in Europe, but uh, even more so fueled by Muslim immigrants. So. I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about uh, universities as well, um, the, the liberal enclave of anti-Semitism. I don't know how well my audience knows history, but every time there was a genocide uh, throughout human history, it came out of the universities. The, the uh -huh. leaders uh, you know, were festered by professors, whatever. They had this knowledge and they thought they could apply it to their people. And in doing so, um, they created genocides. I see the same uh, misapplication of knowledge in anti-Semitism, and I see it coming from the universities. Uh, I, have you heard of an association called BDS? Oh yes, I've heard. Of BDS. I've, yeah, we know about. Uh, I think okay. Israel is quite concerned about BDS, um, and uh, we're, we're quite aware of its uh, many activities. But you know, yeah. Kevin, I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something interesting. I went to the Hebrew University, mm -hmm. and uh, I studied with uh, a number of very, very uh, illustrious professors. And two of them basically uh, told me the same thing, Yehuda Bauer and Stephen Ashheim. Uh, and they basically said, don't trust us. Yeah. Talking, talking about the universities and professors, they said, we are the first compromise uh, we are the first to buckle under, and uh, you need to be very careful what you learn uh, from a university, and think very critically about what we're feeding you, or, or uh, to consider very carefully. And uh, this was quite an eye opener. I don't mean in any way to uh, demean academics or to uh, and, uh, cheapen uh, a university education, which uh, I think is. Uh, in principle, quite wonderful, and and uh, I think most people should have the opportunity to uh, attend a university uh, and st and study what uh, study what floats their boat, so to speak. 
But uh, here, these professors, again, very, very famous uh, uh, in their field, say, don't trust us. Be very careful, uh, you know, was, was quite uh, eye-opening. I also had another professor who is who's actually well-known in biblical studies, Michael Stone. And he says, if you're coming to the university to uh, discover the most, um, to get answers to the most important questions uh, of life, he said, you're making a big mistake. He said, don't come to us because we really can't, really can't help you. So that kind of skepticism that I learned uh, here at the uh, Hebrew University uh, was really, uh, really important. And uh, in Nazi Germany, you know, the the, uh, the universities and the academics were, were the first to compromise because the Germans came along and they offered them, the Nazis came along and they offered them status and they offered them position uh, and more than that they offered uh, these academics and German society they uh, offered them you know this grand uh, messianic vision uh, that part of this messianic vision was going to be you know we're going to uh, put the world aright and the way that we're going to do it is we're going to kill the Jews and I tell you, this is what worries me about anti-Semitism from the universities and from uh, from the alt-right is that it's Nazi. Mm. Okay. And that's that's it. it. It's hate. It I agree. Nazi, Nazi blueprint. Not that uh, people at, uh, on universities somehow like Adolf Hitler or they're fans of, of Himmler. Oh, on the contrary, I'll tell you how... how uh, how much they hate fascism. Uh, they hate the, they hated the whole Nazi uh, scheme of things. But they have, in many cases, uh, embraced this kind of um, uh, Nazi view of the Jewish people. And there are two kind of strands that, that, that people should watch out for. One is that uh, the Jews are some worldwide problem. They're, they're, they're poisoning uh, the entire world, um, and sometimes they don't call, say Jews, they say the Jewish state. So all the ills of the world are somehow uh, connected to Israel. Now this is the, the Nazis universalized anti-Semitism. Before it used to be the French would say we don't like the Jews, they have to leave France, or the Hungarians might say we don't want Jews in our country, but the Nazis with their universal racism said the Jews are a universal problem and we have to deal with them universally. In fact, it was their hope or an intention to kill every Jew everywhere in the world. Secondly, okay, the Jews are Satan. All right, now if you're this, this man who killed, the, uh, who killed the Jews in Memphis, he quotes a Bible verse. Do you remember that? The Bible verse was uh, when Jesus Johnny, confronts yeah. the Pharisees in John 8, and he says to these, these Pharisees, which, by the way, were a very small group of people during the time of Jesus, he says, you know, your father is the devil. And so, of course, um, folks have taken this to mean all Jews are somehow the devil every, uh, in all times uh, and all places. And um, this is also used not only by the right, but it's also used by the left. Israel is considered some kind of, uh, Israel and the Jewish people, they're considered some kind of satanic power. Where it used to be in the Middle Ages, or even in traditional Christian anti-Semitism, that the Jews were the symbol of Satan, or the Jews were um, not uh, the devil the, the devil, you know, himself, but uh, the, the Jews were s somehow... Uh, represented you know, uh, this opposition to, to, to Christianity. But what the, what the Nazis come along and do, and they say, no, we're not talking about a symbol, we're not talking about a metaphor anymore, we're talking about the, the actual devil, uh, the devil himself. And the devil uh, is, uh, in this case, the Jewish people. So it's those two things uh, that make both the left and the right it makes them uh, very Nazi-like uh, in their whole uh, approach to the Jewish people. And like Adolf Hitler, by the way, you know, uh, it's all about a conspiracy. Those Jews are, quote-unquote, tricky. 
and uh, they're conspiring together. I guess they get together at the country club or whatever they do, and they're out to subvert the Gentiles. They're controlling the Gentiles. You know, they're uh, uh, trying to subvert society uh, in one way uh, or another. They're, uh, that's if you're on the right, they're subverting American values. But of course, if you're on the left, they're uh, the agents of imperialism or the agents of colonialism. They're certainly uh, spreading capitalism and oppressing, uh, you know, the people, people uh, all over the world. And uh, they're doing this together, uh, you know, in concert, in concert with each other. So this is what's uh, this is what's really, really, really frightening. Uh, by the way, the Mo the Muslims. Let me. One, I'll just say one more thing. Muslims, some of the Muslims aren't far behind in all of this. Uh, this Islamic rhetoric uh, follows along the very same way. Uh, Farrakhan, not long ago, he said those satanic Jews have infected the whole world with poison and deceit. Okay, so here are the Jews again. They're international problem. Problem's not China. Problem's not Russia. Problem's not Iran. You know, the problem uh, is not uh, rising nationalism or, you know, environmental issues. Nope, the problem is those Jews. And if you're in the right wing, it's the Jews all around the world. And if you're in the left wing, it's the state of Israel. Okay? Yeah. And they're, they're the state of Israel or the Jewish people, they are cast as Satan. This is a scary, this is a scary, scary, this is a scary backward. Yeah, well, I think that's the, the most important part is the evil part of it. This is Anglican Unscripted, so I think we need to cover this, the spiritual element of this. Uh, oh, you, absolutely. You, you, you can't visit um, sites of the genocides around the world without spiritually feeling the evil. You know it, the oppression that's there, the vacantness of of everything, uh, and there is a, a huge spiritual element to this, and I, I'd like you to kind of address that. Well, um, I think I've quoted uh, uh, on your show before when you have me on once every three or four years. Um, I've quoted. <laughs> Uh, there, there was a, uh, a French Dominican, can you believe it, a Dominican who ran the, the Dominicans who ran the Inquisition, mm -hmm. uh, who was the uh, head of the philosophy department at the Hebrew University. And uh, this man was a, he was a monk, uh, uh, but he was a, he was a very uh, a committed Christian. His name was Marcel Dubois. And he used to tell his Israeli friends, most of whom were very sophisticated, he would say, you know, the devil is after you. He either wants to compromise you morally or destroy you physically. And uh, I believe that uh, there is, uh, in all of this, there is the element of the demonic, uh, maybe even in this recent uh, massacre, uh, horrendous uh, uh, outrage that happened uh, in Pittsburgh uh, as much as it is uh, in uh, or not, as it was sorry and the whole Nazi program to exterminate the Jews I do not in any way mean to diminish human responsibility I don't think that uh, when the uh, Germans were killing Jews in open pits for example in the Ukraine that somehow the devil was you know pulling the trigger uh, of those guns, but uh, the deceit uh, that was involved, that uh, this was a good and uh, moral thing to do to, to destroy the Jewish people, I think has somehow has its source uh, in the demonic. How, when, where, exactly, where uh, human responsibility, uh, what, how human responsibility interacts with the demonic, I don't know. But I do know that uh, anti-Semitism is not just dangerous for the Jewish people, it's dangerous for us as Christians. Uh, and we, we need to, uh, I think, take it, be very uh, bold and uh, take strong action, you might say, to strip it 
from our teaching and preaching, uh, take it out of our social context, and, and to let people know, especially if we're uh, in spiritual leadership, you know, this kind of thing is not acceptable. I think one of the, the you know, Satan uses his biggest tool is called the blind eye. Mm -hmm. You know, the villages uh, around Auschwitz and other places, the citizens knew or suspected. Right. Okay. Uh, in Europe, where the eradication was happening, they right. knew or suspected. Right. Uh, they saw their... No, their been around yeah. Auschwitz, around Treblinka, around mm -hmm. Belgium, around, I don't know, uh, around, uh, did I get all of them? I don't know. My uh, Dominic, everybody, yep. uh, everybody knew these Soviet wars when I left out. Everybody knew what was happening. When the, yeah. when the Nazis, Germans, I won't say Nazis, when the Germans were murdering Jews uh, throughout the Ukraine, uh, they would uh, dig a hole, you know, 500 yards from the village. And everyone from the village would come out and watch their Jewish neighbors uh, being uh, executed by bullets, not by gas. And uh, people did anything. People did nothing. And, you know, evil happens, or genocide in particular happens, because of human choice. Usually a few, a minority of people want it to happen. Uh, and bystander indifference. And what we learn from the Holocaust, uh, what we should learn from the Holocaust, that in any situation where we see evil, we cannot be a bystander. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's the, that's my, uh, one of the professors I studied with, Yehuda Bauer, he said that uh, the 11th commandment, he said, I want to add three commandments to the 10. He said, uh, thou shalt not be a victim, thou shalt not be a perpetrator of mass murder, thou shalt not be a bystander. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's that, uh, oh, I'm too busy, I can't get involved, I've got to take the kids to soccer, on a prayer meeting, uh, you know, I'm, I'm afraid, I don't want to, you know, somehow lift my head uh, in any way to, to take a stand uh, or to help, even a little bit. Uh, it, it was this kind of indifference or this kind of fear that uh, allowed uh, the Germans, you know, to get away with the mass murder of the Jewish people and, and, and the murder of, uh, you know, millions and millions of other people. And, yeah. um, you know, this, uh, this is... By the way, again, we we'll go back to the point where we started a minute ago. Anti-Semitism is dangerous. Why does World War II break out? It's based on an anti-Semitic lie that somehow the Jews are in control of the Soviet Union and they're in the control of the United States. And in order to, to stop the Jews and worldwide communism, we have to murder the Jews. This was part of Hitler's... Uh, thinking, a significant part of Hitler's thinking, and as a result of his uh, his anti-Semitism, 40 million people, not just Jews, but 40 million Jews and Gentiles uh, end up dying in Europe, uh, you know, because of this uh, the nonsense. So it's not harmless. Uh, it's actually something that uh, is very frightening, and it's something, again, if we're, uh, you know, uh, have a have spiritual responsibility or any responsibility, it should be a matter of prayer, uh, should be uh, a matter of, you know, that's something we want to, to teach about, preach about, um, and uh, it also has to be something that we need to take a stand, you know, take a stand against uh, in our society. So let's leave on a, a, a message of hope here. My uh, co-worker in Alabama came to Christ. Okay. And now understands that Jesus is the king of the Jews and has a completely different uh, global mindset of uh, Judaism and Christianity. Thank okay. God. Okay. Um, that's, that's good news. Also good news is you're having a clergy tour in February uh, with CMJ out in uh, uh, your way. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, we're uh, inviting uh, quite a few uh, ACNA folks, especially from the uh, Diocese of Virginia, uh, and they're coming along to uh, learn more about uh, about Jesus uh, and his Jewishness. Um, and uh, we don't want 
people to become Jewish wannabes, by the way. We like them to stay Anglicans. Um, but uh, we, it, it's our hope, uh, it's our intention by um, delving into uh, the, the Hebrew Bible and delving into the history and geography of, of the Holy Land and uh, into the Jewishness of Jesus that uh, we'll uh, better understand uh, the life of Jesus, better understand uh, his message, his teaching, and hopefully we can be more intentional about our discipleship. And uh, we're going to structure uh, this FAM tour uh, in such a way that uh, it, it will uh, be an exegetical FAM tour. We'll be talking about uh, ideas and subjects that uh, uh, clergy and uh, laity uh, can use in Bible studies and preaching. And Now, uh, I'm going to put in my show notes how to get in contact with the person to contact you, Daryl. Who, who, who are they going to contact with this? Oh, you contact the very good-looking Daryl Fenton. Oh, I okay. can. Canon, oh. Canon Daryl Fenton. Okay. <laughs> so, when, I grow, tall. <laughs> when I grow up, uh, Kevin, I want to be like Daryl yeah, uh, tall, dark, and handsome. I know it's 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 hard to achieve in the in the Anglican world. Uh, David, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, tough topic. I'm sorry we had to depress so many people, but you know, one thing I learned freshman year of history. I remember Mr. Burles, my my history teacher. He said, you know, lesson one: if you don't learn history, you're going to repeat history. And yeah. um, we have been repeating in my fi my short fifty years. We're repeating history. And, well, you know, yeah, absolutely. But it's genocide. You know, after World War II, we said never again, and we never sit again. on our and watch yeah. one genocide after another. And and you know, we're we're all too busy to get involved with if Rwanda or Darfur uh, or Syria. And yes. uh, this is a, there's a tragedy to this, but. Maybe in four or five years we could uh, do part two. Yeah, <laughs> I think it'll be sooner than that. <laughs> now that the internet between our oceans are, is getting a, a lot faster. Thank you again for your time. I'm Kevin Coulson. Go ahead. I'm David Flaggy. And you've been watching episode 452 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>